Hello, I am Keith Kelly. I teach integrated technology here at Nokomis Regional Middle School, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. I'm going to be presenting on my learning learning from failure, and we're going to be talking about how I build skateboards with 7th grade students. And we're going to talk about the process and why you would do this and talk about that concept. I've already done two presentations so far on my first, my what I do in 5th grade, learning from success and what we do challenges and teamwork. And then learning from challenges in sixth grade, where we do Lego robotics and coding and asynchronous grouping and whatnot. I have two PDs for that. If you do go to teammakers.education, and I'll have that will give you uh, these those two presentations you can look through too as well. This one's going to be focused learning production, and we're going to learn learning from failure, talking about how that process is, and then talk about some safety of tools and what you would need if you'd want to build something like this. Because we've all had the experience when we were younger, most of us of building something in a classroom. So, and I'm going to video all of this and this will be available to you at a later date. If you have anybody else that you think would find this interesting or helpful, I'd love to provide it. My plan is I try to provide, I'm going to talk about the process, how it works. And I'm going to give you some practical, uh, useful tools as we go. All right, so what we're going to do today is talk about production. Uh, how do you teach the kids to do something from beginning to end? A lot of times they want to rush. They want, especially when I'm doing skateboards, they want a completely finished board before the class is over, not much less take the whole time to actually finish it. So I have to teach them, you can't paint before you sand, you can't do this. And there's some steps you have to do before. It's like drive, You don't just start driving, you have to do some things to learn how to drive. Now, today, what we're going to try to do is I'm going to focus on, for you, I'm going to focus, I'm going to define STEAM as we go. And I've been doing this each time. So that science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and kind of how it matches different areas. To show you how this links to certain subjects. So I'm not just doing it one-off. It's not only in my room. I'm going to teach you some really practical tools that will help you in your classroom, whether you use my build a skateboard or not. How do I implement something like this asynchronously, that type of thing, in a limited amount of time, and how you actually apply it to the classroom. And I'll talk to you a little bit about where resources, where you could get some resources if you'd like to do this as well. Now, in the STEAM, my STEAM curriculum, basically, I have it kind of going from fourth all the way up to high school or lifelong. My areas are fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And I've done fifth and sixth so far. I'm doing seventh today and I will do eighth and then ninth and 10 work. In level one, so my fifth graders all learned how to do teamwork. They learned how to work in groups. Somebody was, uh, they learned how to, who had what role. Someone was academic assistant. They did the paperwork. Someone did the, the camera work. Someone built, someone got the, uh, the parts for the person. They followed the direction. And then we actually we uh, learned, you know, science, math, English, reading, technical reading, simple machines. And then we would go and compete with those. So they would apply that knowledge. In sixth grade, we tried it with doing communication, uh, digital communication. How do you communicate someone not in the class? So if you had to build this robot with somebody that wasn't in your class, how do you communicate through videos, docs, things of that nature, emails? How do you do that? And we work on, we did some coding and learning kind of language block coding from the Lego coding, the Lego robot kits. And that was kind of what we worked with sixth grade. Now, seventh, this is what I'm going to focus on now is production. And what that's going to be is how do you produce something, in this case, a skateboard? It doesn't really, it's not the skateboard that the, the focus of the class, it's that you're doing a skateboard. Uh, but in that process, they get a board kind of in the middle of the process and they kind of have to finish it. So production, safety, quality control, all of that sort of stuff. Eighth grade, which I'll do next, next in month, will be on uh, prototype and design. Like rather in fifth grade, they kind of, they, they make a little bit, but a lot of it's, this is how it's already done. Sixth grade, here's Legos, here's what you build. You get a little bit of free build, but not much. Seventh, I teach them the tools. They get their design on their boards can be unique, but it's still, that's the project. They don't all of a sudden not doing a different type of wood-based project. In eighth grade, it's a lot more open where I give them, I show them the tool, 3D printers for this example, or some modeling software, and then they actually come up with a design. We'll talk more of that in the next one. So at this point, I would stop for any questions. I don't see any in the chat.
So I'm going to move on. I will have, again, this curriculum is available on the website for you to access as we go. So learning from failure. And as a teacher, this is really hard to do. So learning from failure as a teacher is is a hard thing to do. It's it's an interesting thing. Uh, when I have the kids, teachers, by example, my younger teachers, fifth grade teachers, when they bring the students in my classroom, I have them, I have my students sit alphabetically, but I make the students figure out where it is the first couple of days of school. It's very hard for a teacher not to walk around and help them. They've done studies on our tests are true and false. And if it's not a standardized test and a teacher is giving it, you always want to grasp true because teachers have a hard time telling something incorrect. I have a hard time when I started doing with skateboards and doing it to stand there and I'd watch kids drilling the holes wrong. I found that they learn more by having a hole, a board with extra holes in it than me correcting them. Even though I've showed them, you know, measure twice, drill once or cut once. Sometimes you have to put them up. Skateboarding is an interesting sport because to do it right, you actually have to fail hundreds of times. If you see a good skateboarder, they have done tricks a hundred of the times and had to fall multiple times to learn that trick. So we're going to kind of talk about how we can use this learning from failure to our advantage. So I'm going to talk to you about how my all my seventh graders build a skateboard. They get a board in partially in the process and they build it all for themselves. So they go and they get the design of it. They get to decide. I now they connect to the other classes. So they'll paint it in art. They go and skate it in gym. So it's kind of crossing curriculums. Now, first step is there is design in this. They have to come up with their design. They get a board. They have to lay it out. You have to think about where the trucks are, where the wheels are going to go, where's your paint going to go, where things are going to be. Uh, the top ends up getting covered by grip tape. So if you do a really fancy design and then you don't go and then you get it covered, then you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to see it. So you got to think about that. They will do the taping out. They will set it up like how they want to do uh, what they want it to look like. The uh, arts is teaching them colors, uh, the rules of three, where where it is centered. So they have to come up with their design and then figure out how to implement it. Some hand paint, some go and uh, do this. The student took and taped it out and cut it out so he could do multiple colors, uh, depending on what their project. Some do it by freehand, some do it by layering. The art teacher makes sure that it's more of an art type based project. We also do a, a logo contest, and I'll talk more about that later. I've kind of changed it, but they compete. They make a logo that's going to get put on the board uh, using vinyl, and we they make it. One of them wins. That gets put on the board, and that becomes the logo. That's that year's logo that gets put on everybody's board, stuck on it. That's through our vinyl printer. So they get to use some design. We're going to talk about using Canva and stuff as for their design or, or Adobe Express, and they'll go and make their design for it, and then that gets translated, and then, then they put that on there on the board too. And they kind of in a competition for trying to do that. Their design can, you can get some, they're looking at what's out there to make uh, homages to different things that they want to. You'll get kids that will work together. And again, they have to think about where are trucks, where's, what's it going to look like when we're all done. The first thing they do is they get it. So they get a blank board. The reason I did a skateboard is these boards are a main, uh, it's a main product. So it uh, has main maple in it. It's a wood base. It's a hands-on. It's a real thing to the kids. It's not just a, a birdhouse. You're doing it for the classroom. That's one thing about my program. I try to pick projects or things, either competitions or things that are going to be real to the kid that they're going to want to do. So they have to learn how to drill. When you do that with learning how to drill, you I have a they have to go through the safety of it. And how I work that out is they go over the tools. We go over the manual in class. Once the manual, and I'll show you how I do this and implement this. They go over the manual in class. Then they have a quiz over the tool, which I've gone over labeling and a question quiz over the tool. And it's open notes. They take it, they pass it, they move on. They have to pass the drill, the spindle sander and the hand sander before they can get their board to start doing. We do do cutting tools, but that's a secondary to this. What I've found with the kids is a lot of them have not learned how to, when I first started this, kids had used, you know, 20 kids in a class, 10 had seen tools, 10 had might have used tools. Now, if I get one or two that have actually touched a tool, uh, it's, it's a shot. What's also interesting, if you ask the kids, you think in your life, are you going to drill? Are you going to sand? Are you going to cut? And they're all like, yes, I am. So 
what we do with this is uh, they drill their own holes. This is them cleaning the holes out of their paint and because they can put grip tape on. So they learn all about a cordless drill, how to uh, drill bits, how to load them, how to load. And then we talk about safety, you know, safety glasses, things of that nature. So here's a video so you can see of them actually drilling. They have to learn, you know, how to hold it, how to balance it, how to clean the holes, how to put a, a, a drill bit in. You think that that's a simple thing, but a lot of them haven't done that at all. So we learn all about drills. We learn a kind of the safety concept. And in that, I teach them universal stuff, safety classes, when you can wear gloves, when you can't, read the manuals, some simple stuff. And we go through and it gets from tool to tool, what's common and what's individual, how to read uh, figures, how to read uh, diagrams, how to read technical reading you know, ma manuals that have words they wouldn't know. We go to spindle sander. So they learn drill presses, they learn and drills, they learn uh, spindle sanders. So how to set this up and how to this, in this case, each tool, we talk about why did you do this tool? Well, this tool does a specific thing. Sp spindle sanders, belt sanders, they're rounding their edge, they're flattening the edge, they're sanding it, getting rid of the rough. It seems daunting. You're like, well, oh, I need all these tools. Actually, so you could, this is just a simple cordless drill, not much to it. You be, pretty much a cordless drill, a simple hand sander would be what you would need. Okay. And then that's pretty much all in the skateboard and some simple hand tools, a screwdriver, a wrench. And that's pretty much you can do everything that I'm doing just using those simple tools I've built up. In the video that you see, you can see I have a couple different spindle sanders, one's belt, one spindle. I've got sanders, I've got downdraft tables to help suck the sawdust away. You want to think about that, how the sawdust is, you know, what you're doing. We're creating sawdust, we're being colored sawdust because of the skateboards themselves. So you can see that's pretty much what they're doing. A little bit uh, noise-wise, you got to think if you need ear, for headphones, uh, safety glasses, they all have uh, simple. But we do some simple sanding. This is on their own. I'm in the room, but they're all working their way through. They've kind of worked their way through quizzes and I'll show you how I do this, but they've already passed a spindle sander quiz, a hand sander quiz and a drill press quiz. So they've kind of been approved on it, almost getting a license and then they're moving on. So, and I, if I have to, I'll hand, I'll help them demo it for them. I also do all levels. So I'm doing from special ed students up to GT students. I do multiple levels i if i have any co accommodations i have to do students in wheelchairs have gone through my program i've raised i've lowered things depending on what the sales skill set i'll do individual stuff if i have to so everyone can do this this is not the nice thing about a skateboard it's really large if you see so it's easy to keep your hands away from things things of that nature if i have a kid that i'm worried i can be right there uh, beside them if you have a really severe there are sometimes you have to say no you can't do this you have to do it in a different way or a different project there is a little bit of safety and again none of these kids are doing it before i've gone over how to do it too as well this is hand sanding and we kind of have two types of hand sanders we have cordless and i go over cordless tools with them versus corded tools and what they'll do is they learn how to sand how to clamp we have simple, uh, a couple vice tables uh, is very helpful. You don't nearly need fancy ones. These are like $20 vice tables. You could have a couple hundred dollars could set you up for everything you need here. But I can, you have some that are plugged in. So you can see they're all kind of working. They've learned, you know, they learn about sandpaper, the lower the number, the rougher the grit, the higher number. And they learn how to do it in stages. Like you don't just do really rough 40 grit and then expect 400 grit to get rid of it smooth. So they do it in stages and they learn all that. They learn how to, you know, line the holes of the sanding disc up, make sure there's a good sanding disc on it. Make sure the vacuum bag is clean. The uh, You can see them wearing masks. That's, that's a good, the mask thing was an advantage to us. We were doing that before. Anyways. And again, I have down draft tables. The cordless are helpful because you can move around any way you want. And each of them, they learn that there's tools specifically for the things. You've got tools that will round, tools that will sand flat, uh, tools that will cut, tools that will drill. 
So they sit and work on this. I'll help as I need. What I find interesting too is everybody's doing this. It is a great equalizer. It's an interesting thing. Boy, girl, doesn't gender doesn't matter. It's everyone's doing it. They all everyone has a link to it. Then we paint. Now, what happens with painting now is they go across in the art room, they paint an art for three or four days. So there there's a quality, it's more of an art project. They will paint a base coat. I'm just using regular water-based paint. We do have to think about cleaning. I'll wear, I'll get some shirts and stuff that can go over so people don't get it on them. Uh, we wash everything using basic uh, washable acrylic paints. I have to think about my room, like covering it, tape, pay, tables and stuff, where's paint, where everyone has their brushes to wash. And again, now art's doing it. Design becomes the kids some splatter, some uh, dip paint, some draw. It's de definitely up to them. And again, they're doing, they've been learning their art thing, you know, elements of art, and then they're applying that too. So it's an actual, actual uh, practical process coming up with their design. What do they want it to look like? And then they have to think about layout. Um, we do all the layout beforehand so that, again, the trucks aren't covering it, what colors, what looks good, and then they'll create one. Some kids get into a little bit more detail painting, a mixture of tapes to help them lay it out. Some kids go and, you know, freehand. Some kids, you know, use different techniques. Uh, there's It has a tendency to run like there was stripe painting all one year, splatter painting one year, dip painting one year, depending on what the kids want to do. Uh, this is dip painting. Dip painting is actually a really quick and easy way. That's just a water. Now, all this is is a, a tub of warm water, room temperature water. You just take oil-based paint. I've been using Rust-Oleum. I, I, I usually do one color, two colors, maybe three. If you're going to do more than one, you do one or two colors, do it, let it dry, and come back, do the other colors. You just pour it carefully right close to the surface. You can use a, uh, a, a pencil or a piece of wood just to you know swirl it more if you want a different design. As you drip it into it, it collects it. And then when you go under the water, you just take, a uh, towel, a paper or whatever, wipe the top off and pull it up. And then you have a dip paint on this. We do, we do, they can do dip, but they also have to have a design on top of it. We don't do just dip just so that it's a little bit more, but simple way to make it look really, really good. If that's something you're interested in and you can, and every board looks a little different. Everyone will have a different little different look to it as they go. Some kids really get into it and hand and our, you know, your artist will shine you know, they really like to do it. So you can see they'll sit down and spend hours like making it look perfect or like they, you know, depending on what they want. I also, you can do it as I do either kids could do a skateboard with wheels and trucks or they can do, and then they pay partial. So they pay some for the trucks and wheels. I give them the board for nothing. If they can't afford it, they come talk to me. What's an interesting phenomenon has happened with it is kids have gone and come to me and pay for other kids if there's any problems. We have enough fun and no one's ever had an issue. If you don't want it, you can make it a piece of art like you saw, or you can make it shelves so that they, I get shelving brackets and it can go on the wall and just be a shelf. Some kids like that too. I still have kids since 2005 that made boards of me coming back going, Mr. Kelly, I still have my board. So once they've got the painting and they've got their base code and they figured what they want their design, then they'll go and we poly it and we use just basic water-based poly. And it kind of looks like, you know, white glue, but you just paste it, uh, spray it, or I mean, or I'm sorry, just roll it. I do it this way because then I don't have to worry about sprays or anything. You can do sprays. So all that is is just a a little ketchup thing with a, with a polycrylic. Uh, you can buy it in gallons and then I pour it in there and the kids get a little, they spray and they roll it, let it dry. They have to realize you clean the holes. And we try to do a couple coats just to seal the paint. We don't go beyond that. If you want, you know, there's higher levels of spray and all that. But for what I'm doing, it's more just to seal the design in it. Depending on the paint they use and how thick, once in a while, I will spray the water bait, a seal coat so that then they can roll so they don't pull up their design. But pretty much that's they they do that. So they've drilled the holes, they've sanded it, they or they set up their design, drilled and sanded. Then they went and took their boards and painted a base coat. Then they paint their design on it. Then when it's all done, then they'll go and put a coat of poly on both sides to seal it so it's all ready to go. 
once it's dried and ready to go, then we do grip tape. You can do grip tape. Uh, you can, don't have to do grip tape, but you can do grip tape. Gives it away for the kid when you're skating to kind of have a place for your feet to hold. So that means the top of the board has to might not have a design, might have a design depending on if they want. It's depending on what they want to do. And then they do have, you can see we're talking utility knives, cutting knives. So we have to use those. I now have metal cutting knives I haven't put on. And we talk about the safe way of doing that, keeping your hands ab above and below and not having your hands uh, and I show them and we've done some filing and some setup stuff and poke the holes where your wheels are going to go in to to learn how to do this. Once they've got their grip tape on, then they can go and put their wheels and trucks. Right now they can, oh, I got black trucks, white wheels, black trucks, black wheels, black, uh, silver truck, white wheels, silver truck, black wheels. They can have a little bit of choice of that. Some kids go out and buy their own stuff and have colors and things of that nature. So basically it's an interesting phenomenon. They have to learn how to go and you know, put a nut on one side, hold the nut and the screwdriver, and then tighten the nut on the other and put do it in the right direction. Kids will flip their trucks around the wrong way. Kids won't tighten them. A lot of times I've watched kids stand there with a screwdriver just spinning, not holding the nut or spinning the nut, not holding the screwdriver. So it's depending on what they have. So that's once they've gone through, you don't need much, just a regular screwdriver. I have these skate tools, but a regular wrench or a socket will work just as, as fine. So then they're going through, they have to assemble them. They have to check to make sure that the wheels are level. They might loosen a kingpin. They might tighten a kingpin. The kingpin is in the middle here. And that if you loosen that, it makes the, it more wobbly. You tighten it, it makes it tighter. So how are you going to skate? But they go and they roll it on the table and make sure it's level. If they drilled their hole, holes wrong, that it will be sideways. It won't be level. They might put on some get wheels. So they have to put the bearings on the wheels and then put the wheels on. And they kind of learn about bearings too, like the, the spinning. These are, they're, they're rolling on a bear and not rolling on a bushing. So they roll a little bit better. And then when they're done, you can see they have a working skateboard that has two trucks, has four wheels, has eight bearings, the eight bolts, grip tape on the top. And then they can go out and, uh, and we go, we actually try to skate it in gym. I also do some skating in my class so that they learn how to load, unload basic stuff. And when they're all done, they put their board together and they have a, a working skateboard. So it's a little bit different than just having a bird. It's a functioning, in essence, a functioning piece of art. So it actually works. Then before they leave, I, I, I send home a letter to the parents, just make sure they know, oh, they're getting the board and we're going to teach them some basics. And then I go and teach them some safety of helmets, wrist guards, uh, knee pads, how to load a board, how to unload a board. We go out in the grass and where it's safer and we go, okay, how do you get on a board? How do you climb off it? How do you stop a board? What, uh, how did you, if you can carve like to, for direction, what if you want to change direction, how can you do it? So I'm doing all of this with them before they go. And I also have some different style boards. So I let them see how like long boards are different, like kind of what is an athletic stance, how to do it. And then we learn that time, how to load, how to stop, you know, how to run off your board. And again, I have had that I have helmets I've built up over time. This is not something you have to have, but you might, all you really need to build up is a class set, you know, 10 to 20 helmets and then 10 to 20 pads. And then you can use it. We wash them and then we just keep reusing them and reusing them, reusing them. They can all have a chance with them. Through COVID, we did an after school skate club, which I'll talk to, but we learn how to carve. We have done it in the gym. I will warn you, you got to be careful of your floor because the, the paint will come off. It will scratch. It's going to run into the walls. So we did some setup. We also kept it so they weren't doing 90 miles an hour. We're also going the same way, but I recommend doing it outside more than inside. They've kind of learned some basics. Also, they can, you know, then they kind of, they've learned that safety part of it. They can learn how to, oh, I loosen my trucks and looser. It's more wobbly. If I tighten it, it's less wobbly, but I can't carve as easy. Oh, I got to put my feet over the trucks, not, you know, in a straight line. There's a lot of things that I teach them. So here's it. Here's a video of us skating in the gym. I do get teachers involved. I'll have my some teachers make a skateboard or also come out skating as well. We'll use the walls. And again, skating is one of those things. We're learning from failure because to do it right, you're going to fall. 
But the good thing about it is it's a lot of times the kids are used to, oh, I, if I'm failing, oh, the other kids are seeing it. But in this case, even the best skater is going to fall. Even the best skater is going to stumble. And that's part of the learning aspect of it. So by having that as part of your thing, it's kind of a release. The kids can all get a chance to, to do it. We do do, uh, usually in the spring, we do a, uh, we did a field trip. There was an indoor skate park at the Y. It's gone now. But uh, so we would go, the kids who wanted you to learn how to do ramps, tricks, and ollies and manuals. I also start to get some older kids to come and help so that they can see how it's done and they'll help them. But this park had different sizes. So you could go high or if you didn't want to, you could go low. And that's uh, the good thing is we have variety. <laughs> Oh, that was exciting. <laughs> so you can see now we we did train. How do you fall on your pads? If, if you saw the kid, you fall on your knees as you're sliding down the ramp. You have elbows, so your knees, elbows. Then you reach out for your wrist. Notice I have wrist guards, helmets. Where how they located? Are they on your head or are they behind your head? Are they strapped down? But what we do is by doing this, we've created a, a safer way, a more controlled way. I had to teach them when you go down a ramp or you go down, you actually have to lean into it. If you lean away, you fall. You actually have to kind of you want to be parallel we talk about angles you're trying to be parallel to your surface again we're doing some geometry some math in that as well and then you can see so we kind of i'm giving them ways of, of falling but in a safe way to practice i practice on the grass first and then we build up to it i give some kids bigger boards long boards i give small so i try to make it a way that they can try it they're gonna fall but i try to make it as safe as possible again with pads elbow pads I do grab some high schoolers. You want to grab your skaters and stuff. You can tell the kids a million times on how to do something. But once you get a high school kid that can skate, that comes down and demos. And those kids like to feel like, uh, oh, great. that they, I, I, Oh, you want to make a board? They get to make a board. I give them some skateboards. So they have some uh, a reason for do it. But they'll come down and skate and show the kids. Like They'll show the basics, but they'll also show, oh, this is how I got to the... And they'll talk about... Oh, I didn't do this day one. This took me a year to get to. This took me fall, you know, and they talk to the kids. There are skate parks around Bangor has one. There's a couple. There's one in, I think, Belfast. Augusta has one. There's different levels. Get to concrete. It's a little bit different thing that you're going on because you're on tar. So if they're going to fall, we try to skate with sneakers on our feet. Notice the long pants that we're trying to skate with. We're not trying to skate with shorts uh, or Crocs or things of that nature. So they get all padded up. And they come out and then they skate. And then when they're done, they get to use their actual board rather than just being, you know, here's a here's this object. We never actually use it. We never actually do anything to it. I do do a club and we do some street skating here at school, learning how to come off curbs, learning how to move and how to how do you go out? How do you get around an object? Do a, I've been doing a skate club. COVID money had money for a skate club. So we were doing it. It was a very interesting thing. When I first did it, I had over 50. I did fifth and sixth, 50 fifth and sixth graders that all wanted to come because a lot of it, they just wanted to be able to stay after and hang out with each other. They'll get all dolled up, do sit, do skate for three seconds and then be in their snack, but just be around. I first start without ramps and then I just slowly add them, but you don't need it. You can see I'm just, this is our school and I just use an, I use a tarred area that has a little bit of an incline. I do sweep it to try to get rid of the rocks for them so that they can have an, a good experience. And my custodians, we got a blower that we clean. So this is kind of them skating behind the school. I block it off from traffic. So you can see there some and what you have is different levels and it's good for the kids to be around some kids that can do it some kids are doing it for the first time uh, a lot of times they just want to try and hang out it's a nice kind of it's a different type of sport too because it's not we're not trying to do an organized uh, we're not playing a basketball game where we have to do a play or a football or uh, it's not you're and it's kind of individual it's, it's you it's what you're doing so the kids kind of like it that way okay so 
in my whole program, and I've done this with my my first PD and my second one, talking about teamwork in fifth grade, talking about communications in sixth grade with the Legos. We manufacture and we we apply our knowledge, and then we go and take that knowledge through our effort, and then we reiterate. By reiteration is retrying to do it. What happens, it's really an interesting thing. Every sixth grade, every sixth grade or seventh grade, anybody who's making a skateboard, they all come back to me as older kids when they're saying, I wish I could do the board again. I wish I could read. I Now that I know I would do this instead, I would truly try it. I would do something different. I would. So that's why in eighth grade, I do, we'll talk about prototype and design. They get a little bit more freedom and try, oh, try this item. And so when they're in, they're done, they have a working skateboard that's unique to them. And what's really interesting is this is the only, only this is the only board out there have skateboards can be expensive um the board we're getting is the core is one of a big a fairly big brand because it's seven layers of maple and it's a nice actor so they're makers and we've gone not only we built these boards they go out and we skate them i have built up a few boards for them to skate on while we're learning this but when we get to the park it's they're skating their board and they really kind of like it so now what I'm going to do is talk to you about some tools that you can use. I'm going to try This is, I am platform agnostic. I don't, uh, I'm showing you tools, but it's not, I don't care if it's uh, Windows based or Apple or Google. I don't care. Um, it's more, I'm just using the tool. And usually there's three versions of the same tool for all. I'm just, for example, in the first two PDs, video you need some way of capturing video of what their building process also collecting information so i happen to use my google classroom and i do forms but I, youtube for videos or canva or adobe express for my logos all depending what you're trying to do so the problem i only see the kids for 20 classes so if i'm going to make a skateboard in 20 classes i don't have a lot of redo time so if i teach it synchronously they come in i've trained them i do the manual I take a period mail. I take some time for them to take the test. We go, then we start doing it. We run out of time. So what I do is I go over the manual. I don't redo stuff. I have videos of me teaching so that if they miss, they can just go and watch that video. Or if they need more help, uh, they can pause and redo it. My test and quizzes are um, open notes and they're like driver's ed where you take and if you fail, you get to take it again until you pass. And what that happens too is, yes, a kid could cheat, but when they go to the tool, they won't be able to use it. It's pretty obvious. And the kids understand that, oh, I want to be able to use this tool and use it right when it's my work work if I if I don't. I And I talk to them. I'd rather have them do it 100 times and get it wrong, but 101 and they've done it versus having someone help them and do it. So to make it go from synchronous to asynchronous, I'm using videos, I'm using Google Classroom, I'm using forms so that they can do this stuff on their own we go over it in a class then they're on their own for taking the quizzes taking the tests or you know, showing me they know how to use it and then we come and i go over another tool so it takes three or four classes to get through the drill the spindle the hand sander so that then we can start sanding and prepping and being done with it if i didn't i wouldn't have enough time so i use google classroom i use forms I'm using Canva as my graphics, could be Adobe Express, doesn't matter, for their logo creation. And we use YouTube video, or you could use Edpuzzle for uh, them watching a video and answering questions as we go. So my classroom, so how the classroom works, they're in, here we go, I'm just going to click on this and open up a Google Classroom that I have here. So here's a sample classroom. So in it, they get assigned to it and they have different tools as they go. So for example, the drill press, these are literal the manuals and we go over this in class. So we read this manual together and we learn. Um, it's an interesting thing doing because we talk about the kids, even the good readers have a hard time because there's some technical words or words you use in a different way. Something electrical being grounded is very different than, oh, you're grounded at home. There's very specific words, chuck key for a drill. Well, that's very specific to their, to the thing. We label the tool and we do this. I talk to the kids. We try to do stuff audio, visually, and kinesthetic. We try, I try to have them hear it, physically do it, or write it down you know, physically or and then and visually see it. We all are different learners. Some of us, you, I could show it to you and you'd know it. 
some of you, I'd have to go and teach you. I could teach you a hundred times visually and it wouldn't work. And only if you did it or only if you heard it, I've got videos. This is the actual me going over the class. So if they missed the class, they can click and watch on it. And this is just using in the stream. This is just using Google meets, or you can use zoom and you're just capturing your work as you go. And that's, I'm just using a meet uh, and, and recording this. And then I give it to them at the end when I'm done. They have a homework where they shorten the manual. They have to hand write it down. They can hand stuff in virtually. I use Google Forms to create uh, things. I am going to probably do a couple PDs on specific tools, just how I use them too. Basically, they get to they can add, take a picture of their work, hit it to, on their camera on their laptop, and hand it to me this way. So if they or they can just wait till class. This is me doing video. Um, this is, I go over, do this in class. So here's this tool. I do this with them and I label this tool. They can sit and watch this. They can push play and you'll hear me walking up to the tool and I'll say, oh, let's label it. And they're writing it down. And then when the quiz happens, it's open notes. I don't, you wouldn't, and you don't, in the real world, you get to use the manual. They don't hide the manual from you when you go oh. So you can see, this is me walking up to the tool, pointing at a section of the tool and telling them about that. So I'm labeling this tool and giving them instructions. The cool thing is they can pause it. They can close caption it. If they, it's, it's universal design too. It's lets uh, kids who need more help get help that way. Now I do quizzes. Uh, what happens when you open a quiz is the same thing. It's a Google form, but this case, for example, if this is pointing at a number. Okay. That, what is that pointing at? They have to go and find out. We've gone over this in class. Then when they're all done, it will, it does each point and it will tell them if they passed or failed. If they fail, it will let them edit the ones they get wrong. It will tell them the ones they got right. It won't tell them the right answer for the wrongs. They'll have to just go edit it till they figure it out. I do have to, the label, they have to pass. They can't, you know, there's no way to go and make a skateboard without passing this quiz. The question quiz is a little different in the sense that it's the same thing. It's a Google form, but this time it shows a picture and I've given him a manual and the manual says, number one, always wear safety glasses. He's not wearing safety glasses. So they go, oh, one, wearing safety glasses. Go to here. Oh, in the manual says number eight, never wear gloves. So he goes here. I also don't trick them. I don't have not wearing safety glasses and wearing gloves at the same time. So they go through and they answer this as they go. I will point out, this also gives you a way to show, there's no way for me to show this video here shows the kid walking, leaving the tool on and walking away from the tool. So you can see he just walks away and the tool's still running. We we staged all this. But that way you can show stuff that you could only do on video anyways. And again, when they're done, they hit submit. And it will say whether they passed or failed. I'm not trying to trick them. Um, it's pretty obvious. It's like driver's ed. That's not the point of this. But this allows them to do this uh, asynchronous firmly. They don't have to wait for me. And that's what all of these, and I do each of the different tools, the spindle, the hand sander. As we get going, they end up making their own manual for the hand sander to learn well, what things would carry over from the drill and the spindle. It's just a, it builds on itself. And that's my classroom. I'm using classroom for that. I'll try to do more detail just on that. Once I get through eighth grade, I'm going to ask what people would want. So they go and it's, they pick and they do these quizzes and they follow along. And I just showed you forms. I collect it. The forms, the cool thing about forms, it corrects it for them, tells them if, and lets them do it. They don't have to wait for me to correct it. And then all I have to do is correct the one or two things that are sentence that are like essays and that, and I check those and it's much easier. I also do a thing where they get to laser engrave a, a logo. And the reason I do that is so they get a skateboard and so they get a board and what I don't want to have happen when they all go paint. So what I do for them is they get a board and they get to make a logo on it. And the reason you want a logo is because they have too many. One of the things that happens is everyone's painting and we have all the boards painted black. The other thing too is I want them to create a design, come up with design. So 
we go and I use Canva. You can have them draw the, or you can just have Adobe Express or another graphics. Doesn't really matter. So basically, I'll if you create, uh, you can create a education account so you can create a class, and in that you can set up so classwork. You can set up an assignment, and what you can do is invite or create, and then so you can create like oh a logo, and I create it, and that becomes the template for them to go and edit on. When I do the logo, I say it can't be more than three by three. It's got to be black and white because it's going to be lasered that way. I, I'm going to, so they 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 pick a logo. They have to go and edit it. Canva's pretty good that way. So you can like click on things and change colors and they have to go, oh, this whole thing has to be black and white. What happens if I do that? Okay, I'm going to make this white. What happens if I do that? And they have to play, they go in and they change the name so that it's their name. And then we'll take this file and they'll learn how to go and learn how to go and export. So I got this. And then when we're all done, we will we'll share and you share it as download as a PNG and they get the file. And then we bring that into the laser. I have a setup. So there's a laptop. You can see they put theirs there. And then this gets a bolted down. Uh, these are a couple hundred bucks. There is a, you got to lock them down that way, but they're very simple. They're not going to do, they're not going to cut through things. They're going to do very simple laser. You do have to control it. I run these, the kids don't run the, the laser at all. I had that way they can, and it runs, takes 10, 15 minutes to burn the little logo. They decide where they want it. Do they want it on the tip? Do they want it under on the backside? Where do they want it? And they go and make that logo. Now, there are some other practical applications. So, for example, Google Classroom has added this feature, but also Ed Puzzle has this feature. If you want, so what you can do in my classroom, if I create an assignment, okay, so I'm going to grab a video. So I'm going to go here. And this YouTube video on is it could be about on me. The same videos I did on how to use the drill press, I could do this too. I have it on YouTube. If I go in my classroom and I say create and I say an assignment, you'll now see if I hit YouTube, I can put an address in. What's really kind of cool is, okay, so if I go here and I say create and I say an assignment, if I go YouTube, now they've added this feature that if i go and put it in one because it's a school it will take out the ads and it will stop it won't start you know youtube sometimes has ads or things at the end but you can see now in the corner i can add questions so what i can do is watch this video so watch this video from the beginning this is again how how it's made and it's so i can right here say add a question and I can say multiple choice or open-ended or a checkbox. And I can say, what year did skateboarding start? And then once I have that, I can go down here and I can give options. So I can say, oh, 1956 or the year, whatever year she said. And then once I hit save and continue, what happens is it creates a spot. So as the kids watch it, they, ha they have to pause. So you can have it. So it, when you're doing it, the good thing as a teacher, you know, oh, they've actually watched this video as you go through. So it's kind of cool that way that you can have stopping points on it. Now, that is uh, that's in YouTube and classroom now. If you want, you don't have to use YouTube. You don't have to use this class, classroom at all. You can go and turn on, you can go to Edpuzzle and Edpuzzle, so I'm going to add content, upload, choose a file. Like I can actually get a get a video. So let's see, I have some videos of the kids assembling trucks. Oh, this one, uh, this skating. I could actually upload that file and in this. So now I can, you can see I have, this is one uploading. This one's one I put up earlier. And in here, the same thing, I can add pages as we go, I can edit and I can assign it to people. And then I can go through and 
add questions. I can actually, with Edpuzzle, you can actually add narrations and things too. So you have a lot more power in Edpuzzle than you do in just in the YouTube. YouTube's just basic questions. But that I do want to say, you want to figure a way to have video and them to watch it and get information on their own a little bit. And it's a good skill for them to learn. I talked about YouTube, always make sure it's in three places because you can never trust it. Now, if you're interested in doing your own skateboard thing, I get parts from Eastern Skateboard Supply. You can get stuff from Amazon, do it. It's a wholesaler. I contact him and every year I buy, you know, a hundred whatever sets of trucks or whatever. And then... I've done helmets and wrist pads and pads over time too, as well as I've built between different grants. The company I bought my skateboards from National Wood Products went out went out of business. It was over in Oxford Hills, but the because it's up in Wood Products up in yeah, North Anson, Maine, they do they bought a lot of their equipment and they do this. And you can actually buy decks from them if you want, and they're pretty good price stuff. So, for example, oh, let me go up here and do skateboards. So if you're looking to do this, you can get wooden ones like so 10 pack for 50 uh, of blanks for 50 bucks. They're, that's clearance. You can get seconds for 15 bucks each or, you know, so you can get and if you talk to them, you can set that up. So if you need to get skateboard uh, skateboard parts, you can. It doesn't necessarily you don't have to have. And I have some blanks that I bought. The company went under and I bought all their stuff. So I make sure it didn't, uh, didn't go away. So I do have some if you want it. It's a, a starter. So that's pretty much my program. I've kind of gone through it from beginning pretty quick. I will try to do some trainings more specific on the tools themselves. But what's interesting I found is the kids really make unique stuff. They come up with great ideas. They like this. I still have kids to this day that come to me and say, Ms. Kelly, I still have my skateboard. It's an interesting phenomenon that happens with them. It doesn't matter who they are. They all like to, to make it. And in the end, they make a working skateboard that they get to use. And I can't recommend the program. Now, more, more than I do. It's awesome. Now, again, in this, we're doing science. We're doing friction and force. Uh, I have to, you know, as we're going. We're doing technology, laser engraver, digital calipers, you know, all the video edit, the video, the all of that uh, uh, asynchronous doing that. We're doing technology. We're doing construction, engineering, like the laminating, how they do seven layers are stronger than just a piece of wood. We look at a Walmart board who uses plywood versus the board we have. We look at wheels and trucks and how bearings are made and why is it, why and how safety equipment works. How does the helmet work? All of that. So we're learning some engineering. We do do English. I kind of had this as one of them because uh, we're doing technical reading and writing in, uh, in manuals and totally and reading diagrams is very different than they're used to. And we definitely do art. They're doing shapes, colors, code, uh, coding, spatial reasoning, uh, tons of stuff around art, like kind of how different materials work together, the poly versus the paint. We're doing math because we're doing rotation, measurement, force, angles, tons of stuff of that too as well. So in the end, we did production. Students work on production. They learn the safety equipment. They learn the tools. We assemble. They So they're doing all these things as we go. So that's learning from failure. So learning, you know, and we're going to talk more about that in troubleshooting a little bit later on too, how you set up things so that kids have to figure out. Next class we'll do, uh, next PD I'll do, we'll do learn from necessity. How do you learn from actually having to have something made for somebody as a customer and how do you prototype and design and uh, that hasn't come thanks thanks for coming for the ride hope you had an interesting time if you have any questions you can contact me if you look here you can steammakers.education is my website that's where stuff will always be there's pds will be posted there curriculums there newsletters you can sign up for mailchimp and the the, the doe's newsletter so every month uh, every couple weeks i'll give a couple and uh, helpful hints and also like things that are out there. I do have a survey. If you did forms.gle slash VSPSEIP7CUYM65MM9. But if you want to click and tell me I'm going too fast or too slow, or if you have another idea or something you wish I would do, I will offer some more as well. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me and thank you.